Resident Evil 4 Remake has a weapon for every occasion. Looking to blow an old lady's head clean off with a 45 Magnum? Sure. Looking to separate someone's legs from their body with a shotgun? Why not? From the Punisher to the Striker, these weapons provided releases of pure dopamine directly to our brains. But what if those highs didn't last? What if the ammo we had in our guns was all that we ever had? Today, we're going to be asking if you could beat Resident Evil 4 Remake without ever picking up ammo. Crazy, right? To even suggest that we could attempt to go from Pueblo to the jet ski without ever picking up a single piece of ammo. This challenge would mean that our guns would remain permanently empty and ammo drops from crates or enemies would continue to rot on the floor until the end of time. But rest assured, I do have a plan. So as Goldilocks arrived in the village and entered the bear's family home to sleep in their beds, break their necks and eat their diarrhea stew, we quickly chased out of the opening house and entered the village for our first test. And I didn't mean test as in fighting off the hordes of religious lunatics gathered around the burning corpse of my colleague. I meant test as in seeing all these ammo drops just sitting there. The shotgun ammo, the pistol ammo, we were already running so dry and these were just asking to be picked up. No, no, we had to remain strong. So after shanking this man's wife right in front of him, we run around the village section as all hell breaks loose around us. The remainder of the opening chapter was pretty straightforward, but I'd made the decision early on to not just avoid enemies on this run. This wasn't my no kill challenge, so we made a campaign pledge to all of you viewers that on this run, we'd kill at least 500 plus enemies and complete all of the merchant's tasks, including killing all of the strong enemies. In the farm, we channel our inner Dr. Doolittle and use the animals to help us to defeat the villagers and the pigman. And in the fishing village, we lure our poor victims into the bear traps so that we can tear their legs off and some enemies even just take care of themselves. I'm going now. I bid you all a very fond farewell. We saved Luisa and are given a light love tap by the chief, and when we woke up in a puddle of our own bodily fluids, it gave us a chance to reflect on the rules of today's challenge. For the entirety of this run, I wouldn't be allowed to pick up a single piece of ammo for my guns. Like all those dads that left to go get milk one day, any ammo found on the floor from enemies or crates would need to be left behind forever. This also meant that I couldn't pick up any ammo to sell back to the merchant for extra money. Just even possessing it would be a sin, so it would need to be immediately discarded. Grenades, knives and resources were a fair game though, as they're technically not ammo, but crafting ammo was a big no-no. Which brings us on nicely to the man who was going to make this all possible. The merchant, aka the Lord of War. This man was the saviour of this run. Whilst admittedly he has gone a bit cheap in the remake and no longer fills up our guns for us when we upgrade our capacity, when we sell our guns to him and buy them back, they would come with a complimentary magazine which the success of this run would hinge on. The strategy here was to hoard all of the highest capacity guns to give us access to the most amount of ammo. Sounds easy, right? Well, you would be wrong. You actually take a 50% loss on all guns bought and then sold back to the merchant. So for every thousand pesetas we spent on guns, we'd be losing 500. But this is where we'd have to make sure that our Antiques Roadshow game was strong. We'd have to min-max all treasure throughout the run, selling everything at the absolute best price possible. With one of the key factors of this challenge being money, we slapped on the pesetas, attached a case for extra drops, and burgled the first house we came across to stock our pockets full of swag. Which didn't go to plan. We found nothing but an old guy doing a number two in the downstairs toilet and a mouldy key in the upstairs desk. And to add to the poo-poo sandwich we found ourselves in, as we went to leave, the homeowner had come home and was standing in the doorway. <laughs> After getting slapped about a bit upstairs, we had a tough choice to make outside the house. With new information found in our grenade only challenge, it turns out that El Gigante regains health if we save the dog. Ammo was going to be seriously tight and we needed every advantage we could get in that fight. As he cried out to us to save him, we remembered the toughest choices required the strongest wills and we left the dog behind. With the good boy's cry still ringing in our ears, we killed the spy on the way back to the village who, if you didn't know, actually rats us out to the dogs in town, but with him dead, he never makes it back there, so there was nothing for us to fight when we arrived. We refill our magazines at the merchant and give a pass to the bolt thrower. Technically, picking up used bolts could have counted as ammo, so we just played it safe and gave it a miss. We arrive at the church where we take care of the swamp demons to gain access to the petroleum for the boat and get ready to cross the lake, and... Oh, nothing bad happened. That makes a change. Once across the other side of the river, we work on collecting every last coin and treasure off the water, grabbing the Red Nine on the boat, collecting all key treasures, including a quick visit to Chicken Island, and retrieve both the blasphemer's heads to get the church key. On our way back comes one of the biggest challenges we have in the entire run. Movie superstar and WWE icon, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Now, I've got a confession to make to you all. I know I said I'd left the dog behind to die, but this was a lie. His little cries hurt my heart so much, I had to go back and free him. I'm not an animal, says the man slaughtering hundreds of innocent humans across the game, but you know, I draw the line at leaving innocent dogs stuck in bear traps. 
So whilst I may have killed my run here, at least I didn't have the dog's digital life on my conscience. Anyway, strat-wise, we start by dealing enough damage so that we could reveal the worm hiding in this guy's butt. From there, a flash would get him down to the floor so we could min-max damage by shooting the plaga before jumping on his back to knife him. After the first cycle, the dog arrives to repay us for saving his life, and after we get the roof of the house applied to our face, we use the mountainside avalanche to our advantage, and with just three bullets remaining, we send the rock back to the ringside. The good boy gets some pets, as is tradition, and we break Ashley out of the church. With the bald eagle now in tow, we press forward back through the village, murdering everyone in our path, and even though we'd had a pretty stern warning, we head over to burglarize Mendes' house for a second time. We kill the savage mutt for the merchant on the way back into town before clearing out the windmill area. With the village area now completely sanitised, we can hand the Savage Mutt task in and refill ready for the cabin fight. We were quite efficient in the cabin to be fair. We ran perfect circles around everyone, knifing them in the back as Luis stunned them and timed our grenade throws perfectly for maximum destruction. After making easy work of the cabin, we reloaded the merchant once again, upgrading our shotgun to the right gun before making light work of the chainsaw sisters by burning them both at the stake to retrieve the checkpoint key. One little tactic I'd noticed in these recent sections was that even when we stunned enemies, the prompt to assassinate them still came up if we ran behind them quickly enough, which I thought was solely reserved for stealth kills. It meant that for as little as two TMP bullets, we could get an insta-kill on a practically full health enemy, which was some seriously good value for bullets. But unfortunately, this wouldn't do us much good in the next section, as Mendez apparently finds out that we'd been snooping around his house again, so shows up to take justice into his own hands. Oh, and to also get his old antique camera back. This fight pushed us to our limits. We are restricted inventory of just my pistol, the TMP, the shotgun and the rifle. We try to maximize our damage output like we did with El Gigante. We get as much damage into the eye on his back as possible to drop him to his knees, putting more damage into him on the ground before giving him some light acupuncture. Soon enough, we were onto the second stage, but ammo was quickly evaporating. As all of our weapons ran dry and our last six TMP bullets slowly drained away, we had to resort to hand-to-hand -hand combat, which wasn't pleasant on the eye. After a gruelling battle and with our final two TMP bullets, we fire them at the red barrel Mendez was holding and blow him into the Shadow Realm. <laughs> Next up was King's Landing where we announce our arrival by disintegrating its occupants with the cannon and breaking into the castle by blowing a massive hole in the front door. We upgrade to the Stingray and grab the broken butterfly at a discount price before using some grenades and our knife strategy to chop through Tyrion's welcome party. One of the grenades we threw revealed to us the holy floating candle that pointed us in the direction of the next area, the dungeon. Ashley tries to bait us into retrieving the key ourselves, but <laughs> we weren't an idiot. We drag her over and she falls into the Garador's pit with us. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but I wasn't taking the easy way out on this run. So rather than use the flash and run strategy, we murder our visually impaired friend in warm blood. The water room turns out to be more rage inducing than usual, a shock to absolutely no one, meaning I had to go back to the merchant for a reload once, but thinking everybody would have gone back to their spawn points, instead I get ambushed at the front door. We scrape through the water room by the skin of our teeth and with just our broken butterfly in our pocket, which the shoeless sellers were relieved to see me put back into my holster. Ashley's had enough of this garbage, so she pieces out and after another refill from the merchant, we retrieve the lantern from the red bathrobe guy. We do a quick spot of fishing to get some heels just as the Raccoon City catfish arrives to try and bust our balls again. Up next was the battle for the wall. Before entering the ramparts, we spend some spinels on the Matilda, which was the biggest capacity pistol at 18 bullets and treat ourselves to the stock for the TMP. And soon enough, after stacking the bodies of the castle for all to see, we reach the armoured El Gigante, who truly was a team player, lining up some truly masterful shots to take down the stragglers that I'd left behind. Once we pack manned up all the loot, we had no further use for the big guy, so we euthanise him in the most humane way possible before reuniting with Ash outside the maze. This section of the game had a bigger than usual break between merchants, meaning that the maze was a tight fight, but once we lowered all the flags, we could squeak through the gates and refill at the merchant in the Grand Hall. Gun rhymes with fun for a reason, stranger. Once there, we retrieve all of the puzzle pieces with ease. We take the knights down with a headshot and flash grenade combo, and we toss a grenade here to break the helmet guy's immersion in the cutscene. Ashley completes her solo adventure, and we head downstairs to mop up any leftover crates. Grab the M4 from the library, which was the highest capacity rifle in the game, and stumble across the Golden Knight in the basement. Just as we were about to cave his metal head in, he tells us to wait. He, he didn't want to fight. All he had ever wanted was a heart. A plaga was such a hollow way to live. He just wanted to be able to feel and experience what it really meant to be a human. So we agree to help, and we start with the feeling of death, which coincidentally was the last thing he ever felt. With the floors of the ballroom running thick with Navistador blood and vomit, we unlock the two gates and make it to the Garador roadblock. The fight with them was pretty straightforward. We forced them to murder their brothers and sisters, and in between some brotherly tiffs, we were able to end one of their lives with our bare hands. 
and the other with a few well-placed shots from the M4. We get thrown down to the basement with the rest of the trash and we have to take care of the little golems hiding in the water. After they were taken care of, the merchant gives us a look at his new item, the Striker. The gun wasn't quite as god tier as it was in the OG when it came with 100 shells, but it still packed 12 and a hefty punch, so we take up the mantle as our main shot. It. We also decided it was time to sell our stockpile of treasure we'd accumulated so far, and holy shit, we were absolutely balling. We were so rich, we could buy the merchant three times over. From here on out, we were going to be living the good life. But the good times couldn't roll just yet. Vudugu was here, and he was looking to strip us of our dignity. Just to be safe, we run around until the lift arrives and we escape his grasp with no trouble. Which is what I would say if I wasn't an absolute mad lad. We obviously take this guy on and book him a first class ticket to the afterlife. With the butterfly and the striker, we do surprisingly well against him and put him down like the dirty dog he was. I know what you're thinking. Did he fire five shots or 21? Well, to tell you the truth, in all this excitement, I wet myself and kind of lost track. But you've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Oh shit. On the lift up, Leon starts to look like mouldy spaghetti, but Luis was on hand to give us a quick injection of the good stuff to see us through. We had a comprehensive checklist for the mines that we needed to work through and no time to waste. Right, retrieve the dynamite and abuse the miners and chainsaw guy. Set the dynamite off and cause a cave in so that we can kill the El Gigantes and boil them alive. Sorry, Philip. Take Pete's car and sterilize the Novi's breeding ground, grab a cold pint, and wait for all this to blow over. How was that for a slice of fried gold? And just like that, we arrive at the crowds of boss fight. How is nobody talking about how Leon mugs Ada off about using knives and then doesn't do it himself? What an absolute hypocrite. With well, Luis now the opposite of alive, we mop up all the remaining tasks and treasure in the castle section before heading over to the clock tower. After doing our best Indiana Jones impression, we turn the spike balls against the zealots and kill the red pajama man straight away before starting the lift. Oh. This was strictly an invitation only lift, so anybody who didn't have an invite was swiftly removed from the premises. Just before the Salazar boss fight, we were taking out the crossbow women from across the way, and one of them tanked one of the headshots from the M4. When we approached her, instead of trying to fight for her life, she just seemed to stop working. It was clear, we must have given her life-changing brain damage because she couldn't speak, move, or do anything. What had we done? We'd caused so much pain to not only this woman, but to everyone we'd met so far. This was almost too much to bear. Was this challenge even worth it? After destroying so many lives, it just doesn't s- Are you serious? Anyways, with our conscience now clear, we're now heads up with Salazar, which wasn't as difficult as you may think. If you didn't know, this pale, anemic excuse of a child was actually extremely allergic to eggs, specifically golden ones sourced directly from the bum of golden chickens. And with the two that we'd collected, we throw them directly into his eyes, causing him to go into anaphylactic shock and die. Yeah, right, as if we were going to betray our morals like that. Instead, we tooled ourselves up ready for battle and upgrade the broken butterfly's power to incomprehensible levels. The fight actually turned out to be pretty tough, and I was immediately starting to regret my decision to sell the golden eggs instead of using them to make an omelette on Salazar's face. But with some decent movement and some devastating combos, we lay the weird little goblin to rest with just about enough ammo. Ada does us a solid and drops us off at the island, and the merchant reveals his latest import, the Chad 7. This thing was a gift directly from God himself. The gaming gods had bottled the power of stellar drinking men into a magnum, meaning that we could send even the strongest enemies to the depths of hell in just one shot. The island freedom fighters brought with them Negan wannabes, electric stunboys, and Legolas on steroids, but being tactful and smart, like using this guy as a human shield, we were able to pick him and his comrades off one by one. We find Ashley having a nap and press onto the lab. After grabbing the key card, we find a peeping Tom trying to get a look at our junk through the window and proceed to collect each of his limbs like Pokemon cards. We grab the MP5 from the freezer room, which, I'm gonna be honest, was a bit of a downgrade from the TMP. It had less bullets, it took up more space in the attaché case, and it cost way more money. Disappointing. We stick the biosensor scope onto the M4 to track down which Regenerador had the wrench stuffed up the chuff and retrieve it to get the level 3 keycard. After defending the keycard whilst it upgrades, we make it to Ashley and inject her with some drugs to get her up and running again. We take down the charlatans in the furnace area and in the sewers, we're forced to try and hit one of the most stressful skill checks of our lives. After grabbing some sushi and battling the enemies in the sewers, we arrive at the bulldozer section. In keeping with the ethos of this run, we do it the old fashioned way and take on all of the enemies in this area, instead of breaking through the hole early. And as a reward for being so faithful to our rules, we get Oberyn Martelt. Before we moved up the lift, there was one thing we had to take care of. A demon from the gates of hell itself was still wandering the halls of the lab and we couldn't move forward knowing he was still walking free down there. So putting aside our challenge for a moment, we head downstairs and face death itself. All to earn just five spinels that I didn't need and couldn't spend. 
Nice. Taking the lift up this time, we find Sadler's secret stone collection and he takes Ashley for a tour of them whilst we gear up for our showdown with Krauser. Good day, sir. My name is George. I'm calling from British Gas. Prior to the fight, Krauser looked to have been eating a jam donut like a psychopath and had it all over his face. When we try and point it out to him like all good friends would, he takes it very personally. We battle through his little adventure playground and eventually made it through to the final era where Krauser jumps at us with murderous intent in his eyes and... Okay, now, just before we get into this fight, I wanted to show you a little something special. Despite our spinels for the most part collecting dust in our pockets, there was actually something that we could put it towards. A very special item, an exclusive upgrade ticket. This was the military equivalent of a golden ticket from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and would unlock the super exclusive upgrade for a weapon of our choice. For Krauser, we redeem our little ticket of death to enhance the Chad 7 so that it now had a five times crit rate. With the holy magnum of justice in our hands, with a nice combination with the striker, the broken butterfly and some grenades, the Killer 7 caves Krauser's face in so bad that the cutscene can't even load it in properly. <laughs> On observing Ashley entering the Temple of the Antichrist, we do some cross-map shooting and reload at the merchant before starting the island gauntlet. We were ready for war here and with Mike's assist we make light work in the first few areas. After Mike runs out of ammo though, the second area was choppy at best. We were practically all out of hills and ammo at this point and took some serious slaps to the face. But whilst many things in life would let you down, disappoint you, the Chad 7 always had your back. We salute Mike and get revenge on his killers before heading into the final stretch of the island. We enter the surrounding Citadel area packing some serious heat and took no prisoners. Everyone was on the menu here and nobody was safe from us. Soldiers were scrambling to get out of my way, running, hiding, and those that weren't smart enough to run met a swift end. The carnage was just beautiful. We break into the Citadel running purely on adrenaline and grab Ashley for freeing Ada from her restraints at the construction site. With our remaining bags of cash, we buy a rocket launcher to finish Sadler off and successfully complete this challenge. Is this joke getting boring now? Obviously, I wouldn't sully myself with such a disgustingly cheap weapon. We sell all of our earthly belongings to the merchant, buying every piece of metal we possibly could and upgrading our firepower to godly levels. We walked into the Saddler fight with enough weaponry to start World War III. In between poking Saddler's eyes out with our high caliber guns, we swatted down every Navistador we could find out of the sky. And as we've done before, we maximize our damage into Saddler's main eye. Our maxed out Killer 7 and Broken Butterfly combo grinded Sadler down to his second form and with Ada's gift we delete him from existence. So, could you beat Resident Evil 4 Remake without ever picking up ammo? Yeah, you could. I thought it would be an interesting challenge considering the change to the capacity cheese we used to have in the OG and it certainly was the toughest challenge I've done so far. Money was obviously the key driver on this run and I thought because uh, the crates and enemy drops were all prioritised and dropping me ammo because I didn't have any on me, um, I'd struggle to make enough cash but we were actually fine. I think it'd be quite interesting to give this a go on professional and see how far um, we could get but that'll be for another day. Anyways, as always, if you mad lads uh, made it this far, you'll be absolute goats and thanks for watching.